Hello and welcome to the final day of the Cryptid Road Trip, or at least the final day for this segment. There's going to be more in the future, so don't worry about that. Got all my stuff packed up, got all my cards ready for the day. Got quite a big uh, finisher too. I think we got 13, 12 cards maybe. But we're going to have to get through them all to get home, because I have to work tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so, I guess that's it. stop for today, which is the Moonville Tunnel here in uh, Zalski State Park. I saw the sign on the way because I didn't know that before. Um, it's a pretty decent sized forest. Uh, pretty, pretty beautiful. Um, feels a little um, less dense than ones in West Virginia. Um, can't really put my, my finger on why. Maybe it just looks like thinner trees maybe. Uh, but we're gonna have to walk a little bit to the actual tunnel. Um, there doesn't seem to be internet out here, but luckily I remembered most of the story. Uh, maybe like, maybe 75% was passing. <laughs> um, but I do have to cross the river or creek to get to it. Um, and it seems to be just a, a trail right to it. Let's, let's, uh, let's go get it. So I'm gonna wager I have to go across the bridge here. I assume this bar here is so cars don't go across it, but I'll double check the signs. But there is a guy over there. Uh... Yeah, it looks like just uh, no, no vehicles across. So I think it's across the bridge and then slightly down there. But we do have to cross the, uh, the ravine of water. Might as well cross the bridge up here first. Huh. What are all these locks for? Gonna have to look into this sometime. It's, uh, obviously, multiple people are doing this. There's some kind of um, strange visitation tradition. Looks like they have initials written on them. Maybe if you and your loved one comes here and lock a lock, then your relationship will be good. Um, that's just a guess, because I didn't know about this. The old dude just seemed to be in relatively good condition. So maybe at some point they're taken down. Hmm. It's a pretty neat thing to stumble into. Oh, is this the tunnel up here? Seems pretty tunnel-like. Because uh, on the Google Maps, it was pointing me over in a uh, over in this direction. Yeah, that's certainly a tunnel. Yeah, it says, this is Moonville. All right, I'm gonna double check the uh, connection real quick. Uh, not not holding out any hope, but <laughs> you never know. Because um, I remember there are four ghosts here, and I remember the story for three of them. And the last one, I, I just completely forget. Like, I don't even know anything about it. I think I'll uh, take my picture of this uh, 
front side with the, with the name. I don't know about the, if there was a name on the back. Um, yeah, I'll take my picture, check the internet. All right, so just uh, still no internet out here, which I was expecting that. So of the three ghosts that are here, there is one that is known as the bully, who on either end of the tunnel will throw stuff at uh, like rocks and maybe like pine cones at you. Um, but I don't see anybody here. Um, that ghost was first encountered by, like a mother and child as they were walking through and the child was, uh, had rocks around him and then, um, told his mom about it. And then they went back and there was nothing there. And then that, uh, persisted from then on. So that ghost is known as the bully. And then there's one known as the lady who will have a scent of uh, lavender on one end of the tunnel. So I don't know which end it is. Oh, that's what I was smelling. There's um, like a campfire here. So I'm trying to smell lavender. And then there's one um, ghost light, like a conductor's lantern that often accompanies uh, former, former railroads of ghost, ghost towns. Um, that um, you can see the light on the opposite end of the tunnel from where you're standing. And then the fourth ghost, I, I don't remember at all. <laughs> like, I don't remember if it's like a ghost train where you can hear whistles. Um, if it's like another person. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't remember anything about him or her. Um, but we made it through the tunnel. Didn't smell anything besides um, by that uh, fire pit. Um, cause Moonville was once a, I want to say train town. Um, but obviously train is not like an export you can have. So obviously they were exporting something, um, maybe, um, mining material and lumber. And then eventually the source dried up and they had to abandon the town cause it was no longer profitable. And then the um, whole area fell into disrepair, leaving the tunnel as it is now. And then um, looks like this hard middle path right here is where the tracks were that they kind of uh, packed dirt down into it. Then you still have the gravel on either side that accompanies um, a railroad to show that this is a federal property for railroads. Yeah, I still only smell that, the charcoal of the, the fire. Got a nice breeze going through here. Then obviously uh, all the walls are covered in some graffiti. I like that long dog. It's pretty funny. Yep, that's the uh, Moonville Tunnel. And obviously I don't remember the uh, the dates of the town or when it was shut down, then when it was made into like a, a pathway. Because there's no internet to, to verify that. But that was the, the Moonville Tunnel. And I'm not super familiar with um, this last day, uh, the order of it, because I was kind of changing a lot of it because I was trying to make uh, the best path for everything. So this one was kind of all hobbled together at the very end. But I think it's still a pretty good route to take. But I just don't remember the order. So I guess I'll see you. You know, we'll, we'll cross the bridge again because that was pretty neat. Um, but yeah, I'll see you again at the, the next stop. If I can get there because there's no internet. But I imagine it's just... Uh, from what I remember, it's just east. No, no, it's west. We're, we're going west, not east.
got a Tovin pole over here. Looks more modern than a what would be a, a telegraph pole. Because electrical lines have multiple rungs, but a, a telegra telegraph pole, telegram pole, would have just been like one wire because you only had one one way communication pretty much, or one uh, receiver. I don't think this bridge itself was um, a train bridge. It must have been redone at some point. Got a nice still creek down there. Got a bit of running water. Oh, interesting. Looks like um, someone made a dam at some point. So it's a pretty straight way of rocks. Those are pretty big. Yeah, I don't see any sign nearby to explain those locks. So I guess I'll just have to add that in later. All right, now on to the next spot. Putting away my stuff, I realized I didn't talk about the kind ghost at all in terms of the card I picked out for this spot. Um, because look, he has a conductor light, like one of the ghosts who can appear here. Um, when I tried to look up the kind ghost, I could only find another friendly ghost. I couldn't find anything about him because there's no um, good descriptors or things that stand out for him that I could find. So if anybody knows anything about the kind ghost where I could find that information, I'd uh, greatly appreciate that. So now on to the next spot finally, for real this time. Here in Leo, Indiana, for the Leo Petroglyphs, and I didn't know this was also a, like a hiking trail. So I guess we can walk that. It's not a not too long, but um, I think the glyphs are over here. In this little protective uh, shelter. Maybe they're actually down here, but we can check over here. <clears throat> but these um, glyphs, there's oh yep, here they are. Thirty-seven of them. And they depict various uh, people and, I oh, they're a little hard to see, uh, various people and animals. And most prominently is um, this guy, because he's uh, kind of weird. <laughs> he has a uh, horns, has a face, and then what appears to be either feet coming off his head, or this could be like his neck and just like an upper body shot of him. But yeah, he's uh, pretty weird. He's uh, right there um, so these carvings are made by the fort ancient people and I never heard of them before because I thought um, when I first heard of this place I thought they were made by the Hopewell or Mississippian people because um, these are pretty old they're about 1000 to uh, or they were created from 1000 to 1650 AD so they're like 1,000 to 500 years old. Um, and I also thought these were originally like the sort of like stick drawings, like someone got bored and drew like in the soft clay. But this is sandstone and they were actually carved into because most of the time when you get um, carvings on, a, on the floor, there are normally stick drawings got like um it's like a bird right there can't quite make out what that circle is but we got some footprints leading this way it's like a deer hoof um, 
Not quite sure what that is. Oh, yeah, it looks like some other people have hopped down here and carved in in the rock. It's not super cool. Uh, looks like a uh, bison. Got another footprint. It's that guy right there. Looks like something with horns. Let's try and walk around over here. Got a, like a, a bird. <laughs> it looks almost like a penguin. Uh, another footprint. And looks like a man. Ooh, that's a man. Looks like there's like a fire pit down there where foliage blows into and gets stuck. Um, yeah, it looks like there's um, some sort of carved markings on the edges there. Can't quite make out what it is. Oh yeah, I was gonna, oops, gonna zoom out. There we go. Yeah, just, this guy just caught my eye. He's uh, right here. Hmm. Hmm. This placard right here says there's 40 carvings. But I wonder what, uh, what this guy is. Looks like a man riding a bird. Hmm. Oh, yep, there's a uh, like another cow or sorts. Um, can't quite see what that is. Looks like just like a squiggle and a circle. And then there's that man. He um, is either like a shaman. Or like some sort of supernatural being, what the uh, the sign says. Um, but I think that's all the ones that stand out. Don't see any others over here. See, so yeah, I think that's it. Because I think. Like in the rain, in, in, um, when the rock's wet, they stand out a little bit more, but it's been dry for a little bit. But, um, but yeah, this guy right here looks like he's been painted over. So I wonder if maybe the like keepers of this area will kind of just lightly dab over them with paint so they stand out a little bit. Cause I don't think they would have, that paint would have lasted just being exposed in, um, to the weather for a few hundred years. Um, but I think we're gonna try and get a picture of uh, the main man. He, he's he's pretty cool. He's pretty chill. Um, and then we'll we'll take the hike because I it's pretty nice out. So I cleverly took the uh, picture of the man upside down and then rotated it in the uh, the gallery. Pretty happy with that. Um, yeah, this is where the, the trail begins. So let's go on an adventure. Because apparently the sign I parked next to there's also some like exposed sandstone, I think some plant fossils. And then there's a nice waterfall and a gorge. And spider webs. But yeah, I guess we're going down into a gorge now. Is that a path? Looks like just like a little viewing area. Yeah, I wonder if there's um, any more carvings. Because right down there would be whoa, pretty good for, for some carvings. But it just seems like it's the uh, that one rock face.
I don't know if you can hear it, but there's cows mooing, like, rather aggressively. <laughs> must be upset about something. Oh, this whole tree must have topped over recently. Pretty interesting. It's almost like um, little tunnels in this rock. Um, I don't know if we're gonna go down there, so I'm trying to get an angle right here. <clears throat> they remind me of um, like in Skyrim when you go into like a crypt. Those are all the like little resting places for bodies in the uh, in the wall. I think it looks like there's like little holes drilled in right there. I hope we get a better look at that. It's always interesting coming upon like these uh, geological formations because just driving around, you're driving through like cornfields and just like occasional hills, maybe wooded mountains, and then you have like a nice little hiking trail with uh, nice views of a gorge and sandstone popping out for people to carve on to stand there for thousands, of years, thousands of years. Yeah, it looks like, oh yeah, this tree recently fell over. Try and make our way over there. Oh yeah, it doesn't look super, super good. Must have been some hell of a storm. Interesting. I bet it's natural actually when uh, this place was underwater and then the water kind of just rubbed up against this at different elevations in its lifetime and created this whole rock. Now it's what it is today. I wonder if this is like a good place for fossil hunting too, with all these rocks at the bottom. But it's also probably been picked over. And might be protected. I'm not sure if this is like a, a state park or a national park. We just have to leave everything as it lies. But that doesn't stop some people. Back under and through we go. We got a whole cliff up there. I think that's the path. bring the right shoes for this, so hopefully they don't get wet. Just be very gentle and walk 
across this rock. Got more of those holes up there. Yeah, they were um, those kind of indents at Worden's ledges. So this might be a weathered sandstone. We continue up this way. Let's go under you. Quite the narrow path. This is correct. This little big ass spider wheel right here. Uh, yeah, I guess that is the path. I guess we'll just have to squat down low. All right, we're alive. Oh yeah, this is the path. There's wooden structure up here. Keeping the, the path from falling over. Oh, we got a sign up here. Hey, look at that. There's just like a bunch of stones just all stuck together. It's pretty neat. These letters? Nope, they're not letters. Plants and rocks. Oh, that's not exciting. <laughs> Thought they were going to be like plant fossils. Well, that is exciting in a different way because um, that's how like um, forests start. You got moss and lichen to break down rocks and then start making soil to eventually have plants grow there. Hmm. Quite the peculiar path. Got the high road close to the rock. Got the low road on a slanted slope. Guess we'll try the high road. A nice view of the creek. Oh, so it is rocks weathering. Huh, it's weird that they form in that pattern. Could you think that they would um, sort of be more um, like smooth as the water erodes it? I think we're about halfway done. 
our little hike, our unexpected hike. And it's also pretty nice that the, uh, the glyphs are at the very beginning. So if you just want to see those, you just pop out, take a picture, and then leave. But a hike is always nice. Uh-oh, we got a fork. We got a fork back that way. And a fork to newer grounds. So let's take a look at our uh, surroundings up here. And we got another fork. Uh-oh. And I think we'll go down over here. Because if I remember the map correctly, it is just a, a loop. Oh, we got a fence. I guess this is someone's property. All right, back we go. I guess that solves one problem. Now we have another fork to solve. That doesn't really look much like a path. So I guess we'll go this way. So I guess now we're gonna loop back around on top of that uh, cliff face. Kind of a small trail over here. But we're just gonna follow the main one. We don't want, we don't want to get lost. Especially after we already found our prize. Oh, we got a stump right in the path. Interesting move. I think this is the path. Now there's where we were. Not sure where the waterfall is. If it's even active right now. Oh wow, look at that. That's gonna be a bad fall. Just getting close to those cows. I'm getting quite overgrown over here.
Can't tell if that's the wind rustling the leaves or if that's a waterfall I hear. Nice view of the gorge again. I think that might be the leaves. A lot of overturned trees. Wow. They all seem to be like be the really big trees too. I wonder if them being too tall caught more wind, which has caused them to fall over with all their weight. <laughs> Getting real close to the cows, I can even smell them. I guess this might be the uh, waterfall right there, but it's uh, not active right now. But there might be a sign actually, because there's a sign at the other spots. We got feathers here. Is there anybody up there? Yeah. Must be way up there. Just to have your feathers fall down here. Oh, here we go. Waterfalls. Yeah, there's no waterfall here. Oh, yeah, I guess it would have fallen through here and then down there. And then it would have taken the, the creek path down there. Can we see cows? A little bit. All right. So that means, oh boy, that's a big old beehive. Ah, spider webs. See that guy up there? It's just uh, avoid eye contact. Oh man, that is directly above the path. Alright, just uh, keep our head down. Don't look at it. Just be cool. Walk away. And there we go. Let's peace out. And... Okay, we're clear. God damn, that's a big one too. Actually, I think that's average size, but that's as big as they get most of the time. It's the biggest one I've ever seen in the wild. It would suck if one day, like, someone's just walking and then the weight of that just gives out and it falls on them. There was a leaf that hit me in the face. Oh, yep. There's the shelter.
It also kind of makes you think that you just have this one random spot here today, but back when the Europeans were all colonizing this area, just how many spots like this they destroyed, like all the mounds, they were moved for farmland and to excavate for artifacts to sell. And then you got some lucky spots like this. So I think that does it for the, uh, the Leo petroglyphs. Onward to, I think a monster sighting. made it here to Carmel, Ohio um, after trying to avoid some or one small piece of road closure that go like 30 minutes around here but um in my initial research where I was trying to pin out each spot to visit um, for the Carmel area creature um, couldn't quite find it um, then I did like some more research and I found the witness report saying that he turned on to Carmel Road and then past the bend of a church uh, he saw the creature so then I was just going to leave it at that and drive Carmel Road until I found a church which is my head's in the way right there and then now that I pulled up here I did my um, actual research to talk about and I found um, an article saying that they were driving on Route 506 and they turned onto Carmel Road uh, up here. And they rounded the bend at Faith and Fire Freedom Church. And when they crossed that uh, hill up there, they encountered the creature. So I'm glad I found the actual spot where this happened. Um, so this happened on December 12th. Uh, 2014 when an elderly couple were driving home and they obviously they came that way on this path and up the hill they encountered a approximately seven to ten foot tall uh, gray thing that had no arms and very muscular legs and when the um, when the guy got home or when they got home the guy wrote, uh, drew down a sketch of what he found so we then uh what they encountered so that they wouldn't forget uh all the details and people will compare them to the fresno night crawlers uh which is you know, pretty close um, but it's also called the caramel walking squid based off of what his sketch looked like um i don't quite know what i want to take a picture of so i guess they rounded this hill and maybe encountered him down there um, maybe I'll take a picture of this bend up here in the church in the background. That might be nice. But yeah, um, I drove like 80% of Carmel Road trying to find a church. Then out here at the very northern point of it, I found a church. And it just so happened to be the correct one. Because uh, it's just pretty much a forest, housing, and fields, the rest of the road. Um, yeah, maybe I'll stand on this corner here, get a nice picture. And as far as I can tell, this is the only encounter of the uh, Carmel area creature. Um, Cause typically they say, uh, this is the only sighting of this creature. But uh, it didn't say that in the report, and there's only the one story of it, so I just assume it's the only one. Um, there's also this one, like, um, I guess, fan art or artist depiction of it that looks so creepy <laughs> compared to the uh, the kind of goofy MetaZoo one uh, with his big elephant feet. But yeah, the, uh, this artist one looks like super creepy with like his uh, long bird-like legs hunched over and he's staring you down 
But the next spot, I think we're actually gonna go back down Carmel Road to go to our next spot. It's a little bit south, but it's fairly close by. So, see you there. Oh, my door's locked. <laughs> Here at Serpent Mound, where I'm very silhouetted by the setting sun, um, I thought I knew enough about Serpent Mound to, to like talk about it. But then I was like doing research online in my car real quick. Um, it turns out we don't really know much about it. It's a lot of a uh, discrepancy and disputes about it. Um, so I guess we're gonna have to walk the the park path and try and figure it out parking lot there's a burial mound right here yeah one of the uh, possible uh, people who built the mounds around here is the Adina culture um, what was it was it? it was like 2300 to 2100 years ago and then later the Fort ancient people repaired it during their period about 900 years ago. Um, so initial surveys of the mound think, or said that um, the Fort Anki people did it, but then more recent surveys uh, put it further back to the Adena uh, culture. Um, but yeah, I didn't know there was a small bear mound out here. So I think the mounds, I'll have to go past the museum where we pay for parking. Uh, it's probably further along that path. We got another sign up here. Because um, I originally thought it was built by the, uh, what's known as the Hopewell culture. Um, but that's kind of like a divisive term because Mr. Hopewell was the um, archeologist who first looked into these people um, and Obviously he has no correlation or connection to the actual people who are researching, but his name kind of stuck to it for a long time. Um, I haven't found or seen like a, um, like another term to, for these uh, people to be called, um, but I guess um, it might be like the Adina or the Fort Ancient, because I haven't heard of them before today. Um, Cause it was the uh, Hopewell and Mississippian uh, cultures who built mounds. I guess they uh, there's more research into them, and they were divided up into their own uh, groups, which is pretty neat. So, oh yeah, oh, something in my sock. Splinter. All right, there we go. There's the uh, serpent mound, and it's uh, believed to have been. Uh, I didn't know about the uh, massive crater part because I knew right along this area is um was where the edge of the uh, Laurentide Glacier uh, stopped, which is why everything further north is all flat. And everything further south is all hilly and mountainous. And then right here was like a nice period or nice spot to live where it's very fertile and relatively flat. Uh, hope we got a map. Oh, yep. So I gotta walk down there. Oh, yeah, there's an observation tower. Oh, that'll be cool. All right, so I'm gonna go in the museum and pay and then continue on the path. All right, so unfortunately, it seems like the observation tower is under repair right now, so I just can't get a good good look at it from the top, which makes it all the more reason for why I brought Sky Snake with me. Uh, so yeah, it obviously has um, astrological symbolism. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know the Wiggles corresponded to the different uh, sun positions. 
that's really clever because um i knew about the possible connection to Halley's comet and then i read up on a possible uh supernova um that inspired it I'm not super familiar with um, like astrology about the sun movement. I wonder how the sun rises from here and sets along that path. Maybe it has some sort of a curved path in the sky. Oh, got who built it. Oh, that's a really cool design. So other things the the fort ancient did it but um yeah twenty three thousand years old or <laughs> twenty three hundred years old twenty three thousand a lot more and there's the tower that's under repair it's uh a lot shorter than i thought it would be <laughs> given how massive this mound is because it's uh over 1300 feet long i don't know whether that's from one point to the other or if that's the entire body of the snake wrapped around and coiled but um it's the world's largest snake effigy you know obviously um no oh, <laughs> yeah i was going to talk about effigy mounds but yeah this is an effigy mound as opposed to a burial mound where effigy mounds are um, have a sacred symbolic meaning to it, as opposed to bury the dead. High hill, the alligator. Oh yeah, I read a little bit about the uh, alligator mound here in Ohio. Yeah, you can see that just fine. We have this, um, all these mounds here were created well before any of the, uh, any tribes we know today, um, were even established. Um, that's just how old, uh, these are. And they were just kind of, uh, uh, almost forgotten. And then obviously, uh, excavating some of them, uh, we were able to find, um, like cultural patterns. Uh, so I guess we're at the tail right here given this spiral. What if I hold you up way up high? You see that? Or am I just pointing the camera at something uh, not helpful? I don't know. Oh, who's this guy? King of the Serpents. Hmm. Moundville, Alabama. Isn't there a Moundville... Indiana? Was it Mound City? It's like a complex of mounds. Hmm. Mm, it's quite the uh, the drop here. Because yeah, this uh, part right here is part of the mound. So, because it was built on the very, very edge of this uh, uh, cliff. Which makes it even more impressive that they were able to get this part in as they wanted, and then have those three squiggles and the head pointed to uh, the sun's movement. I know in um, Ireland, the um, the mounds there are also super old that they were forgotten about as the next culture came about. 
and they were kind of just incorporated into uh, their belief system um, when they arrived, which are the uh, uh, where the faith folk live in the interests of their world. Um, I'm not super sure about uh, if that's the same case here in America, but I would have imagined um, some of the tribes incorporated the mounds into uh, like gathering places or other um, parts of their belief systems. I think we're coming up on the head here. We just passed the third squiggle. And here is the serpent's head. And I forget what he's uh what he's eating up here. Here's um, the uh, oval object, and here's like a triangle head as part of it. And that stairs down here. Manito Indinetorum. Great horn sir. Look much like a serpent. Hmm. It's pretty neat. We got it here. Just a uh, oval look into the uh to the abyss. Right. We'll come back around. Uh, this is the, the top of it, maybe? That's the best way to describe it. I guess while I'm walking back around, I can talk about sky, uh, sky serpents, or the sky snake. Sky snake sounds right, um, but also known as sky serpents, um, they are long serpent snake-like things that float around in the sky that are spotted all over. Um, as I, as far as I can tell, there's no like solid explanation for these. Um, it could be like a uh, loose plastic floating in the wind. That makes it uh, long and windy as it flies through the sky. Um, some people think it's a type of air rod as a camera um, optical illusion. Maybe this will be a good spot for the picture in the, uh, the curves of the snake. Unlike the uh, uh, Nazca lines in Peru, 
Um, people think that this is um, meant to be viewed from above because you can fully enjoy the uh, the entirety of it. But you know, just walking around, you can get a pretty good feel. It's a uh, it's a snake. Come back on these ridges. Um, I think it's the inside of those that point to the sun. But I wonder if um, these ones point to anything. That would just be absolutely insane if it does. So you have so many things that lined up. That's the uh, end of Serpent Mound. Pretty, pretty cool place to visit. Give a nice little walk around. Fortunately, the uh, tower's closed. But maybe we can come back one day and get up there. I think that's uh, all I have to say about Serpent Mound and Sky Snake. Um, there's not much to Sky Snake because everyone views them from so far away that it's just um, pretty much like, oh, I saw a Sky Snake, and that's it. <laughs> Can't really give much of a descriptive um, uh, account from being viewed from so far away. Um, but I guess I'll go further, further west to Cincinnati. Well, I actually might stop and eat something. But no, might might lose some daytime if I do that. But I think I'm good for the rest of the day. I might as well try and find something to eat. Walking back to my car, I uh, saw this little mound over here. So I guess we can go check that out real quick. Because there's just that one burial mound over here. So yeah, this is another burial mound, as the sign says. This one's a lot smaller. I'm not sure how uh, the size compares when it comes to burial mounds. So I think uh, that's truly everything for Super Mound. Um, I imagine there were more favorable mounds here at one point, but they're probably mowed over. Um, but luckily, Super Mound is all intact. So I don't think I said this, but I think this is the last remaining um, uh, mark on the earth from this culture. So it's very important that it stays as is. I kind of decided last minute to stop here at the Ohio River. Um, if I turn the camera around, there's uh, Cincinnati in the distance, and here's the river. And then along this sort of stretch right here, there's a cryptid known as the Octoman. And the first time I heard about him was from one of Dee's stories in the, uh, the Medizu Discord. So I'm like, eh, I can stop by here real quick. Uh, he has a good perch right here, uh, just to talk about him real quick. Um, but in 1959, um, there were reports coming in from 
a man in New Richmond, Ohio, which is kind of a bit further uh, east of this spot, um, called the local newspaper and police saying something came out of the river and he couldn't quite describe what he saw. Um, but the next day, well, they published that uh, about his encounter. Uh, but the next day, a woman had an encounter too and was the first one to compare it to an octopus. And then from then on, um, the Octoman kind of took on more octopus-like um, qualities like tentacles and stuff like that. Um, which I find kind of interesting that once octopus was attached to this thing, octopus became some of its uh, features. Um, but I brought along the Oklahoma octopus. Oh, can you even see that? I think it's a silhouetted out because I'm looking at the sun. Let's turn around. There we go. There he is. Because um, the Octoman isn't in Metazoo yet, even though um, I first heard it from Metazoo, which is pretty neat. Um, but the Oklahoma octopus is just a big octopus spotted in some lakes and rivers of Oklahoma. Um, I didn't look too much into him because I think he's just um, sort of like a Loch Ness Monster type creature there where he pops out like, ooh, I'm here, and then he pops back in, saying like, oh, can't find me. Um, but yeah, I always love uh, learning about new cryptids and stuff, so I greatly appreciate D for sharing that one story that one time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I'll get further on into the city. While coming through the area, well, actually I planned this a long time ago, but I decided to come back to Jester's Cards and Games, which just so happens to be the first place I played MetaZoo. It was for the qualifying round or qualifying tournament for the Water Tower. And I brought a, uh, a Spirit Deer deck with like a Spirit Deer, Vector Moose, Deer Lady, or Deer Woman, um, White Stag, and Not Deer. It's all the deers you can have at the time. Now I have a Kirby mother, so she can fit in there pretty nicely. And they're all in there, all uh, full play sets, as well as some other stuff um, to help out spirits. So my deck was pretty thick. I think it was like 60 cards. And I was I was annihilated <laughs> um, by by gassy and flaming effigies. Um, but you know, what's what's a trial by fire to be the best learner? Um, but yeah, they were their first uh, group of people where I played Menzu with, and I really enjoyed it. And they they taught me some tips and tricks, and I took that and revised my deck. And before the water tower, the day before, they held a metal tournament, and I brought back my revised deck, and I was <laughs> still obliterated because they are really good at what they do. Um, this time it was mainly by a uh, embedding the soul deck, and I didn't know what was happening until it was too late. <laughs> but um, I still do enjoy playing with the, the ghost deer because each set brings one new one to kind of uh, way out your, your yeah, kind of uh, scale your deck to uh, different angles with all the new ones. Um, but yeah, I think I'm gonna pop inside and see if there's anything cool inside because they have a uh, whole rack of uh, Metazoo cards and a lot of the uh, LGS ones are still there. Uh, but, oh yeah, and there's also a Hero Quest 1 stuff there, so I can, I might actually get something new. Um, but yeah, I think that's uh, all I have to say on that. Oh no, wait, the the team here is called the Sin City Casters, and uh, they're, they're really good. Uh, they're the ones who taught me. Alright. Alright, so I'm out of the store now, and I managed to get some, uh, some good cards for a good price. They didn't have before. So I finally uh, made a little dent in the Hateful Eight. Now I have three out of eight. Got some more Hero Quest that I'm currently focused on. Then some uh, uh, 30th, uh, 30th anniversary and some Hero Quest, or other Hero Quest 2. 
I'm kind of not focused on that one right now, but 1.0 is my main focus right now. I think I'm at like 40 out of 66. That's pretty respectable. So yeah, gestures, cards, and games, it's a pretty good spot. Even for other uh, GGCs like uh, Magic, Pokemon, um, what's it called, the Disney one, Hello, Lucarna, and even One Piece and other card games like that. You got uh, Warhammer stuff. It's a great little shop. So I finally made it here to Loveland Castle but it's closed. Um, I kind of expected that, but I just wanted to take a picture of the outside. Um, it is a historical museum. Um, I don't know what kind of museum it is because I'm here for frogs. Um, I don't know. I don't quite know which order I should do them in. Um, I guess I'll start with everyone's favorite, the Loveland Frogman. I even got mine signed at uh, the Frogman Festival by, by Kelsey. That's pretty neat. It's one of my favorite cards because of it. Um, so, in 1972, from onward, I think the last one was 2016, um, people in the Loveland area would spot a frogman about four feet tall, um, just kind of walk around, mind his own business. Um, as far as interactions go, that's about it. Um, in one report, uh, someone reported him holding a wand that shot, uh, little sparkles. That's why... Some depictions of him is, uh, have, <laughs> so that's why some depictions of him has him as a wizard, like Metazoo. It's kind of fitting so then he can teach Sam some magic stuff, because he's a wise old wizard. It's called him Evergreen. But, to every light, there is a dark. And this is Shanahook, who, um, is much older than the Frogman. And that's because when the French letter... <laughs> French settlers came in this area. Um, the Indians warned them about a demon frogman who lurks in the Little Miami River, which is right behind me. I thought there was um, no trees here, so I can actually see the river. But along this whole stretch, it's just trees blocking the river. So I guess I got, got a picture of him from uh, just a pile of logs. Not super interesting, but it's kind of creepy for. For him, at least. Um, but yeah, um, Sean Hook would I think drag victims into the water and then kill them. Um, but it's interesting that just that little warning sparked fear in the settlers to have um, them be worried about Sean Hook. And then many, many years later, like 200 years, a frogman came about in the same area, matching the um, relatively same description as Sean Hook. Except this one's a lot friendlier. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's interesting how um, how legends will stick around just by the slightest mention, and can then change over time. Because um, these are a pretty good example of, of two. Oops, I hold them correctly. <laughs> Sean Hook and Frogman. I think that's it for them. But, um, so, oh, another thing. Uh, the Frogman here was uh, my inspiration for this whole idea about doing these trips. Because during the Water Tower, it's obviously close to the Loveland area, uh, during the Frogman Festival. And I wanted to get my, my signed uh, card here uh, with a picture of the, the castle in the background. Um, but I never got to do that because of um, time constriction for the tournament. Uh, when, we were, when we were released, it was uh, pretty dark out. And it was like, I think past nine. Um, but the sun is setting here, so it's kind of like um, that one scene from the story when Sam's trying to escape the, the storm, or the spirit veil. No, spirit storm. Um, and he's backed up against the castle, and then the frogman lets him in, and the story goes from there. Uh, except there's no spirits around here, hopefully. Um, but I finally got a 
accomplish my goal of getting my picture with the frogman at the castle. Um, so I guess the next step is to actually go inside the castle one day. Um, but maybe next year, because um, this is a pretty good area to come visit and play Mezu, especially at, uh, at Jester's. Um, so onward further north, back home, but still got a few more stops before I actually get home. So I'm here in Springfield, Ohio, instead of uh, Crosswick or the Air Force Base, uh, because uh, I can really find a good place to park over, let alone like really get out and take a good picture. So I just kind of took my phone out of my window and just took a quick picture. Um, um, for Crosswick, um, he, he um, was first spotted in a creek when he attacked a pair of boys. And that creek is, um, Satherthwaite's Satherwaite's <laughs> Satherwaite's Run. Um, it's a very small creek. Uh, when I drove by, um, I actually drove past it. I'm like, is that the creek? Because I can't really tell. I drove past it again, like, I think that's a creek, but I can't see anything because on Google Maps, it's just a, like a one pixel sliver between where the creek is. I drove past a third time, like, I think that's the creek. I shine my flashlight out. And this whole area is like a, a suburb area, so I don't want to like I'll be poking around too much. Um, so I like, eh, I guess this is it. So just take a picture of what I think would uh, lead over to the creek. It's just um, like the railing and the bushes that I got didn't actually get any any water because um, I think it's a like a really really small creek. But as for the story of the Crosswick Monster, um, in 1882, two boys were fishing in that creek. Um, I'm assuming it like opens up at other parts. Uh, if you might have heard in uh, one of the reports, um, or in an article, um, the person who wrote it went there and then like investigated it uh, for themselves. And they actually did uh, get a poke around a little bit more um, and found like a few deep uh, fishing spots or spots that could be used for fishing, but being like 150 years ago, um, it's obviously changed drastically. So I can't really know for sure. But um, in that creek, um, the two boys were fishing. Then all of a sudden a monster jumped out and it was a 30 to 40 uh, foot long reptile described as a snake with arms and legs, um, sometimes referred to as a salamander. Um, and it uh, grabbed one of the boys and then drug it to a hollowed sycamore tree that's about uh, 26 feet in diameter. So it's a really big tree. And the screams of the boys alerted some men who then uh, rallied up 60 more men, or 60 men in total, uh, to go cut down the tree and free the boy. And as they were doing this, the monster popped out again, dropped the boy, and ran. And then the men chased it over the hills and the monster found another hole to hide in and a pile of rocks and it was never seen from again. Um, so it's a pretty interesting story. Um, like all the people in the story um, were named from like super old newspaper articles. Um, so there's definitely some like credence to what happened. Um, but as for like 
a 30 to 40 foot reptile. Like the world's biggest reptile currently, I think is a saltwater crocodile. I'm not entirely sure on that, but it gets to, I think I looked it up earlier, um, 22 and a half feet long is the biggest one. Oops, I was playing music. Um, ooh, my light went off. Oh, it died. Oh, it, uh oh. All right, I thought my, my car battery died, but it just timed out. Um, what else is there? Um, so I think the size might have been uh, over exaggerated like a little bit, maybe like a like 10 foot sort of salamander like thing. Uh, came out and got him um, but other than that I don't think there's much else to uh, discuss um, so as for project blue book which was um, it doesn't seem as bright in here as it was which was oh, that's because I have the other light on there we go I figured out my situation uh, so project blue book was um, I don't know if it was proposed but it definitely took place at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Um, and it was the systematic uh, filing and study of UFOs uh, by the Air Force. And that lasted from 1952 to 1969. So not super long, um, but they definitely did a lot of work during that period. Because um, once, uh, once they were shut down, they had... 12,618 reports, so that's a lot. <laughs> um, I don't, I didn't see how big the team was, but I think I've seen it a few times, like some uh, documentaries. And I want to say it's like four people who worked on this. So they were definitely working around the clock for this. And they had two goals. Uh, one was to determine if UFOs are a threat to national security. Uh, so that's a good thing to look out for. And the other is to scientifically analyze UFO related data. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that entails. Maybe it could be like um, reverse engineering, some possible theories. Um, um, uh, seeing if like uh, any report is like a fake or if it's an actual UFO or if it's like another country's uh, uh, spy plane or something like that. Um, but in the Condon report, um, kind of summarized their all, all their findings and it said uh, basically summarize up to that they're not likely to find anything useful in this project so then that um, led to their uh, um, dispersal but um, most of the reports they found so probably over six and a half thousand of them were misidentifications of like clouds and stars and normal airplanes and then uh, maybe like the next large percentage were at the time classified airplanes. Um, and then there's obviously a small portion of that, um, I'm not sure the actual statistics of it, that are pretty interesting stories in themselves about some uh, unexplained flying objects. Um, and then the whole uh, report, or all their findings are under the Freedom of Information Act, so you can actually find it online. But um, uh, I forget what, what exactly, but some of the details are redacted. Um, I think most of it might be actually. Um, I can't remember remember the specifics of that. But, um, yep, yeah, Project Blue Book. And then the last guy I'm going to do in the spot that I can actually, you know, rest at, not disturb uh, locals or, you know, the military <laughs> is the uh, uh, stick man of Clark County where um, it actually happened pretty recently in 2018 um, a guy was going to work in the early morning where he pulled out of his driveway in the sort of uh, northwest region of Clark County and that's just a bunch of like rural roads I'm actually in Springfield to try and get no, and a halfway decent picture after how bad the uh, the crosswalk one is probably going to turn out to be. Um, 
But yeah, as he was um, sort of like pulling away from his house, a white stick figure darted across the road and um, in front of his car, headlights, and hid behind a tree. And um, what's interesting about this particular thing is that it's not just like whoosh across the screw, um, wash across the road. Um, he actually stopped and observed it hiding behind this tree, kind of uh, with it poking around um, a little bit. Um, then I think it um, ran further into the woods. So I actually stopped and like properly observed it. And there's um, an interview with the guy who saw it um, on, I want to say like, it's called Cryptopedia, something like that. Uh, which is pretty cool that they actually got um, an interview with him. And then most of the sources aren't like super in depth. So you definitely want to go check out that interview for some good details. But um, in that uh, interview, he tried to look up what he saw. And the closest thing you'd find was the Nightcrawlers in Fresno, California. Um, but obviously, they're kind of same, kind of different, uh, kind of lanky, white. But the stick man is obviously has arms and uh, a torso, and the night crawlers are just uh, legs. Um, and he also um, asked his neighbors and friends in the area if they ever seen anything like this, and they weren't super talkative about it. Um, either they were um, f- fearful of like looking like crazies, or um, were just uncomfortable with it. Um, but I think that was the only major sighting of the stick man that came out. Um, so I was going to take a picture of a fountain around the corner. Cause I think that's a pretty nice landmark that sticks out. Um, cause I couldn't really find like a specific spot for him. Um, so I just kind of, I was just going to wing it at the end and then like, okay, well, I guess the fountain will do. Um, but there's one other thing I want to talk about the stickman in that there's a little Easter egg in his card. So if you are in Clark County and you look closely enough at him, you know, let me get a, try and get a good angle on this. But if you look closely at him, this will happen. So, uh, yeah, it's a little, little Easter egg there, but you didn't know that. Um, so I'm going to go take my picture of the fountain and then compile the pictures in, into uh, the post form and then go on to the, the last spot on the crypto road trip before I go home. Uh, it's been definitely a long journey and I'm looking forward to seeing my dog again, but he's, but he misses me. stop I have planned for this crypto road trip is in uh, Ohio State University, which is in Columbus, Ohio, um, for the handprints that are known to be here. Um, they are, appear along uh, Hopkins Hall, which I'm surrounding now and trying to find the where the handprints are. I think they're on the other side of the building. Um, but um, as the legend goes, these handprints are from a girl who was trapped in an elevator here. This car passed. So this girl was here uh, late one night and she was leaving and she was stuck in an elevator all night long. She was banging against the walls trying to let anyone know that she was trapped in here. Um, But no one came. But when the morning come or came, Um, She was found to be completely fine, except uh, mentally uh, distraught about what happened. And then eventually um, she died in a car crash. And 
her ghost came back here, uh, leaving handprints for what the, uh, the school did to her, um, causing her to die. Um, so I think they're just around this corner. I'm not entirely sure. And as the legend goes, or as part of it goes, uh, these handprints can't be scrubbed off. You know, they're permanently there. Um, but there's one main one up here, and then there's been two others that have been found, uh, I think throughout the whole campus, or just on the building, I'm not entirely sure where those other twos are. Oh uh, yeah, but found it right here. So it's on this column right there. And here's the uh, surrounding area of the park. And there's the road to park on. But uh, here is the handprint. Let's uh, compare it to my hand. I get my shadow out of the way. And there's that. Seems to be slightly smaller than mine. Um, I don't think the other ones are in the surrounding vicinity. But I can check real quick. Um, that doesn't seem to be one. Um, about this side. Nope, no other handprints here. Uh, these look like uh, a few fingerprints, but not good enough for me. Oh, there's some finger smudges there. But I brought my, uh, my smoke screen card because it has a uh, handprints on it. It's kind of fitting for this. So line up my picture uh, for this. Well, the sad truth about these handprints is that they are unfortunately fake. Um, they are actually made of spray paint and these are on the uh, an art building. So if you like come up over this way, you can see uh, that kind of a art gallery going on there because um, it was made by art students just trying to make um, like a sort of statement, like a ghost story. But uh, it's a pretty neat story to have. So, yep, I don't see any, any other things that stand out. Not on the floors either. Um, so yep, I guess I'll head back to my car and then head home. Um, yeah, it's a pretty interesting legend for the for the school because I know lots of uh, colleges and universities have like uh, like two to five legends for each one, ranging from interesting to kind of boring. <laughs> but I think this one was super interesting and definitely worth uh, visiting because uh, I went to Purdue University. And there was the legend of if you go under the uh, clock tower, uh, you there's different versions of this, but you wouldn't graduate on time. You wouldn't graduate in four years, meaning that if you have a longer stay or shorter stay, then you're fine. Um, or you wouldn't graduate on your expected time. So there's different uh, variations of that little uh, myth um, for people to kind of be worried about walking under because if you go there you'll you won't see anybody walking under the bell tower and then there's the uh lion fountain which is a uh sort of a four-faced uh rectangular prism uh with the lions on each face that spew water and if you drink from each lion uh, for an exam then you'll do well on it so it gives you luck um, those are the only two that I can remember. Um, but even to this day, I haven't walked into the bell tower because uh, 
the pandemic happened before I, I graduated, so I couldn't actually do it after I graduated. And of course you don't want to risk any sort of bad luck. So I never did it. But maybe one day I'll return. Maybe on a crypto road trip I'll go. But um, so I'm almost back to my car and that's all I have to say about uh, handprints and college uh, myths and legends. So I'll see you when I get back home to my dog. just made it back home. Ugh. Someone's happy to see me. Huh? Maybe there's a few dead bugs I have to pick up. But oh well. And like a wall? When I got back from the Hodag Festival this spring, yeah, didn't leave my side for like two weeks. <laughs> so I guess that's gonna be the same, right? Yeah, this was a long journey over the past week or so. Um, got all my my bounty, my my journey. So let's uh see what I got. You just want to play with your ball, don't you? So I got two medium-sized Mothman posters. One big one should be the about the size of the, the Frogman one. Looks like a comic cover. Don't want to unwrap that yet because I have to, you know, get a frame for it. Mothman shirt, a book. I remember seeing this art before when I looked up uh, images for Flatwoods Monster because um, this was the one of the reference images I used for my pixel art of the Flatwood Monster. But I didn't know the person made this into a book. So I got it because I really like that art style. Mothman coin, a Flatwoods Monster lantern. A Flatwoods Monster t-shirt, a Mothman plushie, a Serpent Mound coin, a Respect the Locals t-shirt. That was my mantra for this trip, not to disturb anybody while I was passing through. An awful plushie, another Mothman t-shirt, two Funko Pops of the Sphinx and Cyclops. There was also a Mothman one, but he was super expensive, like $225. And I thought the lady said he was only $25, so I got all excited. <laughs> But uh, I'm happy I found these two. A Flatwoods Monster hand towel. A Cryptid Thing cookbook. A Mothman pizza t-shirt. A Constellation t-shirt that glows in the dark. A book on constellations. And a book on how Indians view fossils. The Dark Tower promos. The Mothman Festival promos. Five caster packs. Four target blisters. The Immortal Workshark promo in their Mothman Festival promo. And a handful of cards from Jesters. And while I was away, I got two Hello Kitty promos that arrived in the mail. That's uh, quite the bounty of goodies. Well, before I go, I was going to say that um, it's been a lot of fun doing this because I had uh, more than double the stops the, the last time, uh, which took a lot more time to do. Um, I obviously had the, the vlog this time too, uh, which took more time because I had to actually prepare something to say and then share that but um yeah it's been a lot of fun and um i think i'm gonna do one more bonus one tomorrow morning um where i had my own cryptid encounter here in fort wayne so i'm back here in fort wayne um right next to my old high school um to share where my uh cryptid experience happened um so there's the high school homestead high school then across it is the middle school. And then for cross country, we'd come to this little uh, park and then run around this field, maybe the woods. And then at the time, the trails over here are relatively new. So I'll walk the, the trail where it happened. Um, so when I was first going into middle school, uh, me and my best friend joined the cross country team uh, just to kind of try it out. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't stick around. Uh, we just tried the, uh, the summer tryouts, and we didn't like it, so we, we left. Um, but um, one day we were 
walking down these trails and we meet in the early mornings. I guess I'll I'll describe more when I get there because it's a bit of a walk. I know I don't think the story's gonna last that long. Or at least the uh the introduction of it. So it happened when um, everyone was walking these trails and I turned to one of the buildings or one of the houses uh, over here and uh, I saw something on the roof and then I pointed it out to the person I was walking next to and I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, looked and saw or overheard me talking about it. Um, so I guess I have to go find the, uh, the building. I think it's uh, right before these fences up here. Hopefully the place isn't uh, overgrown by foliage when you can't see it. Hmm. Let me uh, double check the map real quick because I think I, I passed it in those trees. So I managed to actually find the house. I don't know how I missed it. It's uh, this one right here. I just uh, peeked through the tree line right here for a better view. So on the, uh, the peak of the roof right there, there were... Uh, two giant birds on either end and um, as I, as we walked by we thought that they were like statues kind of like you see on a, a Japanese temples so those are called sashihokos um, but then one of the birds flexed its wings back meaning that they were alive and we were like whoa those are huge birds um, and we just continued walking on because we like, didn't really care like oh, okay well you know, big birds, but whatever. Um, then we came back, uh, they were still there, so we got another look at them. But, um, they just were like really stuck in my mind. Like, wow, those are like surprisingly big birds. Like, um, that very, uh, peak of, uh, the building, um, I measured on Google Maps to be about 20 feet long. And the birds took up a quarter of that segment, um, lengthwise, so they were about five feet tall. Um, and the, um, the sun was rising, so they were just silhouetted against the sun, so I couldn't actually see, like, what color they were, but they were, um, like, raptor-shaped, like, uh, eagles, falcons, hawks, and, um, years later, in, um, high school, I brought this up to the person I was walking next to, and I, like, hey, whoa, look at those birds, 
Um, he remembers that. And so that, um, that verified my um, account of it like years later. Um, and then college, I came across a cryptid called Washington's Eagle. And Washington's Eagle has a, um, an interesting story behind it. Um, here, I'll, I'll walk back to the car so I'm not all creepy. But um, Washington's Eagle was first documented in um, The Birds of America, which is a book by John Audubon, who was an ornithologist. And in that book, he documented 435 birds. And this one named Washington's Eagle um, cannot be found. And so some people think um, he made that as a hoax or it was misidentified as something else. Um, but having um, the best selling book of all time, like um, one copy sold for the most amount of money um, ever for any book. Um, and for him being this level of um, like master ornithologist, like he knows his birds and documented every, every other one like perfectly fine. Um, having one hoax in there or one misidentification uh, doesn't seem likely. Um, and in his book, he said he encountered this four times around the Great Lakes region, which just so happens to be where Fort Wayne is. And that these birds are brown in color and are about four and a half feet tall, which is in the range of what I saw. So linking that all together, I'm pretty sure I encountered two Washington Seagull on that roof. Um, so yeah, that's my, uh, my cryptid encounter. I think that's, uh, all I have to say. So, uh, thanks. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again later. Bye. You say bye? Hmm? Yes, true. Look. No right there. <laughs> Bye.